Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, tutorial about prompt based writing as a common assessment and for high stakes testing. So we've been talking a lot about process based writing and using mentor text as a way of launching our students into writing a variety of genres and also taking us through the process of uh, coming up with ideas or generating topics, planning our writing, drafting, getting peer feedback, revising, and publishing. Uh, sometimes we do more of each of those things, but that's general process-based writing. This is prompt-based writing that doesn't allow much time for process. It's uh, just kind of a writing on demand kind of thing. Uh, so the prompt based writing and common assessments and high stakes testing, this is what we're going to focus on today. And there are two pieces of uh, text that are in this module that I would like you to read as well. So I'm just going to record this video all the way through, but you can stop and start whenever you need to. So let's just get started. So prompt based writing is when students um, respond to a prompt. <laughs> so Mostly this is for, for school-based assignments, common assessments, or a high stakes test. It's not something that you see in the real world. You don't see journalists doing this unless it's for some game show or something, I guess. I don't know, maybe that exists. Uh, so common assessments are, um, I'm gonna move myself here. <laughs> common assessments are when you have a local test or um, assessment at your school or at your grade level. So let's say in our English department, all the ninth grade teachers are gonna give a common assessment. Everyone gives the same test on the same day. Or uh, junior level, uh, everyone's doing a practice ACT writing assessment. So everyone does it at the same time across the whole grade level. These are done at your school. It's for you as the teacher, it's for your department. You look at the data and you try to see what are students doing well as individuals and how can I help them? But what are, what's happening in my class? What's happening at the grade level and how can we improve these? The state test is different. It's a criterion reference testing program. So this is, they look at very specific standards for the state of Oklahoma, for example, or the AP standards or the ACT. And then these are things that they expect people to know. Um, and then those scores are sometimes compared uh, with other people at the same grade. That's a slightly different kinds of tests, but you get the idea. One is at school and one is for the state. So these are when we typically have students do prompt-based writing. So the writing process uh, that we've been talking about a lot is process pedagogy, that writing doesn't, writing takes lots of different iterations. Um, it's, it, it happens once, but we kind of think about it and we circle back to it. Uh, we want to draft, we're thinking about publishing, like it, it takes time, you know, all these steps and all these phases and not necessarily in this order. Um, sometimes I don't need to brainstorm, I can just write, it just comes. Um, and other times I struggle to have a topic. So this process uh, based pedagogy typically takes um, several days or weeks, depending on how long that writing is. But the prompt way of teaching writing is students are given an article with a prompt, they're given a time limit, they're not given any instruction. They're expected to transfer their instruction to that moment. There's no drafting. So it's a first draft writing. So they're expected to be able to do certain things just through drafting. Um, they might plan, but no one's telling them to plan. It's just up to the writer to decide if they want to plan. Uh, and then, it's, then there is a analytic or holistic rubric that everyone uses. So a common assessment, all the ninth grade teachers would write that rubric, all the Junior teachers would get that rubric for an AP practice test. There's a rubric from the AP for the AC writing. There's a rubric from the AC. So you have the rubric that's available. And the expect expectations are that the students just draw on all that in that moment doing that writing. And you can imagine it can be quite stressful if the students aren't really comfortable doing this kind of writing. So why teach this sort of sort of inauthentic writing? I say it's inauthentic because it's not something that we see in the real world but we do see in schools and students spend a lot of time in schools. So we teach it because it's a school-based genre. We teach it because um, these kinds of um, testing situations cause anxiety and students need confidence. Uh, sometimes grade advancement or entrance into programs is at stake here. So how well students do at this matters. And some people make decisions about students based on scores. 
we it's just teachers, parents, administrators, your department chair, they look at the scores and they judge the students. And sometimes they even judge the teachers by the scores too. Um, and so I think it's just an ethical choice to um, teach students how to do this so that they're confident. Uh, and then it will transfer to other things. And those of you in my YA Lit course that I asked you to do those blogs, the video blogs and um, ABAR reading and things like that and have discussions in class. We practice all those strategies. The question is can, when you sit down with a prompt, can you make a claim, offer evidence, use tech support right in that moment? So there has to be kind of like an automaticity or a comfort, like how do I begin? How do I work through this, right? So that's prompt-based writing. So the first thing that's really important for you to do, and all the materials that I'm giving you are something that you can use with your students grade six through 12, and also your 2T, uh, some form of this process. Uh, the first thing you really want to do is make sure you gather baseline data. So even if you're, your grade level or someone's doing this test in April, it's important to do something similar earlier on in the school year to find out how comfortable your students are with it, what they already know how to do. And then you can have like little um, prompt-based practices along the way, not too much time, but revisiting it so that they develop a level of comfort. So first we wanna know what students can do. And this is something you wanna find out from your your 2T if they're interested in doing any sort of analytic writing, or maybe they're really nervous about um, some kind of high stakes test coming up. Uh, so here's what you have to do today. Uh, first, I'm gonna ask you to read the two texts. There's two very short, like about three, four page um, essays that I'd like you to read. Uh, then I'd like you to practice the prompt. So there's two essays and two prompts. I want you to just choose one and write the prompt. So you can get a sense of how it feels for you. Um, when you're doing this, it's really important that you need to understand what the prompt is asking for, anticipate what your students might struggle with or what they might have to know or be able to do, and then develop uh, with other teachers the rubric. So if it's a common assessment, you and your teachers can develop the rubric. If it's a high stakes assessment, uh, assessment like ACT or AP, then that you'll already have that. So you'll know what the, the expectation is. But as a teacher, you don't want to ever ask your students to write a prompt that you created without ever having done it yourself or ask them to read something that you haven't read. So I know it goes without saying, but it's kind of important to do that. All right, so you can pause here um, and read these two uh, stories that are in the module. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> um, so um, now you have uh, written the prompt, I assume. So you've read it and you've written one of the two prompts. Um, if you have done this wherever, it's fine. But if you can put it into a Google Doc or a Word Doc, I'm going to ask you to turn this in, turn this in to me. So you might have to pause it again because maybe you read the articles but you didn't write the prompt, so you can do. It. So typically. Students will have like one class period to read the article and one class period to write the essay, which is like typically after bell ringers and announcements and hopefully there's no fire alarm or lockdown drill or something like that. So maybe you have about 30 to 40 minutes during class to do the writing. Um, it won't take you that long to do the writing, but if you think about um, how much time in sort of a timed prompt-based writing um, is allowed, see what you can get done with that. Okay, so now that you have your essay written, I'd like you to go in and use um, color coding, color code the text. So anything that is a plot summary, anytime you're summarizing or just having obvious facts about the article, make that yellow. Anytime you use supporting details, for example, evidence, quotes, put that in green. And then anytime you have commentary, like interpretations, include uh, conclusions, so what, insights, opinions, put those in blue. So do that now. Go ahead, pause, pause, and do that now. Okay, so do you have a good balance? Do you have some yellow, some green, some blue? Do you have a sense of, in as juniors and seniors in high school, what is most valued? Yeah, 
mostly blue, maybe mostly green, but you don't want too much green because you don't want the somebody else's words, all the quotes taking over. So a little plot summary, sprinkles of green, and lots of blue interpretation of the green. All right, so now let's review the prompts a little bit and let's see how uh, students have done with this. So we have some sample student essays to look at. Okay, so you have the man in the water prompt that you looked at. Um, after reading man in the water, select one important theme to write an essay about. So here's the first thing that some students still get. When it says essay, it doesn't mean paragraph. When it says essay, it means beginning, middle, end. It means text evidence. It means uh, interpretations, um, commentary. So essay means there's different parts to it where a lot of times students just answer the question and they think it's just an answer, not an essay. Um, create a theme statement, so they have to know that. Uh, the author's purpose main point and lesson of the article. Um, and then here you see in the body of the essay, discuss Rosenblatt, so they have to know that that's the author. <laughs> um, analyze the language. So not only would they have to put a quote, but they'd have to pull out words from the quote and say, this is a simile and this is how it works and why it's important. Here's a symbol, this comes up a couple times and this is why it's important and this is what it does in the text. So that's the commentary. Analyzing is the commentary. And some students may not know that's what they're asking to do. Uh, and then consider Rosenblatt's response. Um, and so now you're kind of making an assertion or a judgment about that. So lots of different really kind of sophisticated moves are happening in this prompt. And again, this is a prompt that would be given to sixth grade all the way through 12th grade. And of course the essays would look a little bit different depending on that. Same for sometimes the earth is cruel. So this is a, another a literary uh, an analytic essay. Discuss Pitt's description. So there's some discussion, which means you have to pull quotes, description of the Haitian people's actions after the earthquakes. You have to be able to pull in a quote of the description, um, analyze the language of that quote, and then again, consider uh, the response, the author's response. So there's still similar moves in both of these, right? Okay, so the do what chart is a really great strategy to teach students that they can use uh, when they're doing this prompt based writing. It's not going to be in the instructions. The instructions don't say make a graphic organizer, do some planning. No, the prompt never says to do that kind of stuff, but we want our writers to know that they have the agency to do that. So it's helpful to make like a do what chart. Do review the article, do write what an essay. So this is a great strategy for unpacking the prompt because there's a lot of sophisticated moves that a student has to do, right? They read the article, now they have to read the prompt and then they have to write all of this in like under two class periods or like 80 minutes, right? So here's what all the sophisticated things that are being asked to, to do in a prompt. Select an important thing, theme, write an essay, create a theme statement, Whoa, that's a whole thing. Express the author's main point. Discuss the author's description. Analyze the language. Consider the response. Discuss the author's purpose. Explain how we apply this. All those things. But you know what? This is a really great method, especially if you have the students with dysgraphia, to kind of create this chart. And then as they do it, they check it off to make sure that they hit every point. Because the reason that some people don't do so well on the common assessments or high stakes tests is because they leave out certain things. And this happens sometimes even on the OSAT. Not that you did it. Okay. So some of the things that we would teach the students or hope that they draw on from their experiences in previous grades or other classes is what is a theme? So the theme of a literary work is the writer's message or main idea. It's what the writer wants you to remember most. Stories, novels, plays, poems sometimes have more than one theme. So they could talk about several themes or one theme. There's no really right answer necessarily. Some themes are easier to point out than others. A character might say something 
about life that's clearly important. For example, in E.B. White's Charlotte's Web, Wilbur says at the end, friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Oh, isn't that nice? There's the theme statement for you. Um, that's a statement of one of the book's themes, but often you have to be a bit of a detective to discover others. The author leaves clues, but it's up to you to put them together and decide what the important message is. So those are more complex pieces of literature or essays to unpack. So although some nonfiction texts are written, written solely to present facts, others also intend to present a writer's message, um, influence readers' ideas, people's places, events. So nonfiction texts also can have themes, or I might call those main ideas. So the topic is different than a theme. And I'm going to say of all my years teaching and observing uh, teachers, a lot of people get this wrong. So the story's theme is different from its topic. The topic is what it's about. The theme is the so what. So to identify a theme, sometimes it helps to generate a list of topics or big ideas in a story. So common topics for themes that you'll find in stories are usually abstract nouns that deal with human relationships, such as bravery, friendship, injustice, and revenge. And so those two prompts were asking your students to come up with names to name the theme, right? To name the theme. So the theme is more than one word like love or prejudice. The theme statement must be a complete sentence. So if you could say, the essay explores bravery or explores prejudice, those would be topics and not a theme statement. And so a lot of students get this wrong and more importantly, teachers don't teach it this way. Um, so what these prompts are asking, and I think a lot of times they're trying to say like, what is the author, what is the author saying about prejudice or bravery? Um, and we don't often get to that because it's a little bit more abstract. So a good theme statement applies to people in general not just specific characters in the text. So a good theme statement might be a little bit broader. So here's some examples and they're a little bit cliche and I think we can do better than these for sure. Um, it's important to stand up for your beliefs. Prejudice is a destructive force in our society. If you interfere with fate, you will be sorry. So you get a sense of some of these that are um, guiding principles in some ways that are um, uh, broader than the the essay or the book or a poem, um, but then you can find support that supports that, right? You can find lines and phrases. So when you're making a theme statement, you have to articulate it in a sentence and not just say a word. So here's some more. Brotherhood, sisterhood, humanhood. Well, it's a humanhood, perseverance. So these are topic words not themes, theme statements um, would turn these into a theme statement with the so what piece. So what about brotherhood? So what about human nature? So what about perseverance, right? So what about it? Because it may, may not be positive. It may be critical. The author might be making a specific commentary about that. And again, there can be multiple. So if you think about helping your students um, think about topic versus theme, you might have them generate a list of words for something that they read. So you maybe take a minute and think about the words, the topic words that come up for you or um, the, whichever uh, story that you ended up writing about. And then turning that into a theme statement, which I'm sure you did in your essay, but maybe you didn't. Maybe you just talked about the topic, but didn't actually turn it into a theme statement. So here's some of the things and what are you noticing? This is the second thing. So one in your prompt, you have to talk about the theme statement. The other thing you have to talk about is the notice of the language either Pitt or Rosenblatt used to describe the relationship between man and nature. So the language is a whole nother thing. If your students probably learned about similes when they were in second or third grade, maybe metaphors too, definitely personification with all the books that they read with talking animals. Um, probably symbols too, and but do they know what all these look like in different kinds of genres and nonfiction, or um, 
that typically they'll be writing essays about nonfiction or essays or um, short stories or poetry or something. Um, but can they identify them and name them when you're not asking them to fill it to um, to notice, right? So there's now they have to look at the language in the writing without you nearby telling them what to notice, right? Um, and they have to be able to say, oh, I see that Rosenbot's using a metaphor, Pitt is using simile, and how does that work? And why is that important? What are the two things being compared? And why do we use these devices? So all that work that you did in your class or all the work that uh, the teacher did the year before about helping them analyze language, they now have to do in this moment, right? And are they able to make that transfer? Are they able to make that transfer? That's kind of the key. Um, the other thing they're asking, so many things, themes, theme statement, language, and they're also uh, in the prompt asked to identify the author's purpose, to inform, to instruct, to persuade, to expose, to pay tribute, a call to action, to comment, to honor, con to condemn, like any of these things would be what the author's purpose is in this nonfiction writing, right? And the students have to remember to do that too. So they've made their theme statement, they've talked about the author's language, and now they have to remember to do this. How do they remember? They have their checklist, right? Because you've taught them to do that probably. All right, so here's where I'd like you to do a little practice to see what students do um, in these kind of practice tests of um, one of these articles. So we're gonna look at the scoring guide. So that is on Canvas. And then here's kind of a snapshot of the scoring guide. So um, it's six, this has been a scoring guide developed by, by a program. So they have six categories. Obviously six is the strongest. Um, they, it's kind of a holistic rubric where they don't have something for like descriptions for each category for each um, criteria, uh, a little bit here, I guess. It's just not very, like, it's not very analytic. Okay, um, so thoughtful theme statement clearly addresses all the writing tasks, thoughtful use of uh, description, language, response, response, numerous textual uh, references and a conclusion. These are all very subjective descriptions in what's thoughtful versus reasonably thoughtful. <laughs> uh, rubrics are kind of problematic and I'm gonna, we're gonna look at that a little bit later, but some sort of um, way of gauging what we're noticing um, in the student's writing as part of the baseline data. And then also to um, notice patterns across your classes and across other grades. So this is one of the kinds of rubrics, but this other one, uh, that is in Canvas has a little bit more detail on there. Okay, so now I'd like you to score the anchor set. So the anchor set is in Canvas. There's six different student writings, six examples. Um, I'd like you to score, rank them one through six. So there's six, there's a one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it's gonna be really easy to see like which is the top and which is the bottom. You can like, you can see right away when you look at them based on the length. Um, but then you have to look a little bit more closely to decide which is like a two or three, which is the five or six. Um, so get in there right now. Uh, look at the anchor set. It's on Canvas in the module. And I'd like you to rank them. And when we uh, meet in class, I'll tell you which is which. Okay. Um, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so now we're going to look a little bit closer. So um, looking for a balance when you're uh, doing this scoring. So how much of it is yellow summary? How much of it is green supporting details? How much of it is commentary or blue? Um, noticing that the fives and sixes have more of this balance, right? So you can see, this is just a sample snapshot. A three paper has a lot of yellow. That's the summarizing. Uh, a four has a great deal of quote. The quotes of, uh, I'm sorry, yes, the quotes have kind of overtaken it. So it's more quote and less commentary. And so the author's words in the uh, essay are really doing more of the heavy lifting rather than the commentary. Uh, and then the six has a better balance of blue and green and yellow, right? Um, so that's one way of kind of getting a sense of uh, writing. Um, strength. 
Okay. Um, so here's what to sort of look for uh, when we're thinking about what our students are doing well. So does the student re uh, respond to what the prompt asks? This is kind of interesting. Like, do the students have the capacity to work through all of those moves, theme, theme statement, analyzing language, uh, considering author's purpose, having a conclusion, putting in quotes. Can they do all that in 40 minutes? Like, can they even understand the article first? And then they have to do this. This is a lot, right? Um, so can they work through the whole thing or did they run out of time? So that might be another thing that you might have to teach your students is about time management. Um, do they respond to all or most of the requirements? Do they understand what a theme is and present a theme statement or are they still just thinking about it as topic? Um, does the essay exhibit a balance? Is there sort of a hook at the beginning the tag is when you say like title, author, genre, you know, in this essay by Rosenblatt, we see that sort of like that introductory phrase that comes with the more writing that you do. Is that automatic for your students or is that something you have to teach them? And is there a conclusion or sometimes they just run out of time? So what you might get in some of the um, essays that you read or what you might have noticed in the ones that you just ranked is that the theme, uh, something like the theme is that the, main, the man in the water is a hero, right? Um, so this is focusing on the character, not the theme. The theme is that 100,000 people died in the earthquake. Well, that's a plot, <laughs> uh, but not the so what of the entire story, right? It is something that happened, but it is not a message that's applicable to everyone or generalizable. The theme is bravery. So that's a topic, not necessarily a theme. Um, one day a plane crashed into, into the Potomac and then, and then, and then. So you might have students that just want to retell. They just want to retell a bunch of stuff. They want to tell you everything that they read. And I'll tell you, you do not want this. As an English professor, and none of your professors here at the university either, we don't want you to summarize the story. <laughs> That's the smallest part we want to hear your, your commentary. We want it, you to pull a quote, analyze the quote, and offer a commentary. And That's kind of sophisticated stuff, but you can't really do that well unless you know what's going on. But some students are really just working on, do I know what's going on? And they don't get to the other part yet. So sometimes it's a reading comprehension issue. A theme is that sometimes the earth is cruel. This is better, closer to a theme, but it's a reference to the people in the tragedy and also the title. Um, so here's the last thing that I'm gonna ask you to do as part of this module, um, is that now that you have these six pieces that you've um, been able to kind of get some baseline data on, you kind of know, the strengths, like which students are strong in this area and which students need some more support or a direct instruction about it. Uh, I'd like you to offer some feedback and give your students an opportunity to revise their practice tests, right? So if you're doing this in several times, you want the students to do the writing, to get the feedback, to make the revisions so that when the time comes that the common assessment counts or it's the high stake test for the state, they feel like I've gone through this a couple times so that they know exactly what to do. Um, so you're gonna give uh, practice giving some feedback here. Okay, so some of the things you might want to give feedback on is if there is a hook or an introductory paragraph, or if there's the tag statement, if they kind of introduce the um, article, the essay, the genre, the author, if they offer a brief summary statement versus retelling, if their thesis statement is a statement in fact versus topic. So those would be some feedback that you would give them. Um, so I'd like you to do two things. I'd like you to do um, one, select one paper that is that you can give um, marginal comments on. So you're gonna copy and paste it into your Google Doc where you have your essay, right? So you have your essay and then you color coded your essay. Now I'd like you to copy and paste a student's essay under yours and practice doing marginal comments. And then I'd like you to copy and paste another student's essay and write a dear student letter. And here's two examples. 
you can see how uh, how it's done. So you can pause me and read the uh, slideshow. Um, you can see this is kind of how it works. You copy and paste it, and then you write your comments. Remember, you're talking to a student. And here's the dear student uh, letter, what you might write to the student. Um, so it's really important that you're providing students with constructive comments and meaningful feedback. So giving them tips, what to change, what to revise, motivate them to revise. So lots of uh, encouragement and that's going to enhance their writing. So tips for responding, um, being an effective uh, commenter um, so that enhances their writing and uh, don't comment on the things that are like every little detail. We're not interested in the grammar. Notice none of this was assessing grammar, punctuation, none of that. We're talking about ideas. We're talking about ideas. Uh, and these um, are all first draft writing in the common assessment. So we wouldn't expect everything to be perfect in that way. We want to make sure that the student has the ideas first. Um, so offer constructive criticism. Don't be overly generous, but don't be discouraging. Uh, per, per, uh, present your feedback carefully using a respectful tone. Use the add comment function of the Google Doc. When you write your letter, um, make sure you address, just write dear student for now. Begin with a glow or positive statements and then end with a grow. So like, it's really clear. Okay, now go to your graph, draft and do these three things. Um, so it's really manageable and it's really concrete and they know exactly what to do. And again, think of your dysgraphic student who's gonna be like, what do I need to do? And you can say, oh, here, do this, here, do this. And especially if you can be really clear about your suggestions, that will be less overwhelming. Um, okay, I think I have that, but you can read this. You can pause me and read this. Okay, oh, just some errors to look for. In Sometimes the Earth is Cruel by Leonard Pitts is about, do you see, this is a little bit of a grammar thing, but it also makes it confusing to read. So anything that really interrupts your reading. So to help students correct this, cross out the in, right? You don't need this part. Sometimes the Earth is Cruel by Leonard Pitts, comma, is about the earthquake in Haiti. All right. So here's where I'd like you to practice your responding. If you um, already selected one, great, but uh, you can select these two. So click on this and click on this, copy and paste them. Um, for the first one, do the commentary practice. And for the second one, do the uh, student letter practice. And then here's uh, two examples uh, on the slideshow here of how teachers have done this. So you can click on those and read and compare how you approached it versus how other teachers have approached this. Um, one more thing, make sure you proofread your letters. Remember you're a role model. So um, maybe you wanna run yours through Grammarly. And, oh, here's the last thing. Okay. Um, you don't have to do this part, but I do want you to take a look at this. Um, so after, so if you do this with your students and with your grade level, um, you how this might work is like you have your all like I had 180 students and I had them all do a practice writing test. Uh, and then I have it all together and I want to say, OK, now I have 180. What are my patterns here? What do I notice? Um, what is the strength of this group of students and what is an area that I need to work on? as a whole, right, as a whole, that this way I can design my instruction to make sure I can support the needs of the students. So I have all this baseline data, all these essays that students have written, I know what they can do well. I also have identified maybe some concerns with students that I wanna give them individualized attention when we're writing um, and students who are really strong. So I wanna uh, like ramp up their instruction or give them some challenges. If I'm doing this with other teachers, then they have 180 students too. So we are like looking at ours across, are we noticing the same thing across, across both of our groups? 
Uh, and if not, maybe it's my instruction and I need to change things. You know, maybe my class, my teacher colleague has some suggestions because her students are really doing great on something. Maybe they understand theme statement really well and mine don't because I didn't do a good job teaching theme statement. Uh, so that's also, you're looking at your baseline data and trying to figure out the strengths of the students, right? So here's a sample letter. So if my teacher, if I, um, looked at my colleagues 180 papers and she looked at my 180 papers, we might write each other a letter about what we're noticing. Uh, or I'm just going to look at my own and make some notes about what I'm noticing. So here's a great example of a letter that a teacher uh, wrote to another teacher uh, after looking at a whole bunch of um, sample uh, essays. Um, so you can see strengths, overarching issues, a few other things that are scattered, and what's next, right? Uh, so these are suggestions for going back to the papers to make some revisions. And then you might even find out that some students just ran out of time. And so really time management is gonna be the key. But I think this is a cool way to think about what do you do with all that baseline data? And then how do you start planning? So in your teaching of literature, poems, articles, and in your teaching about reading response and literary discussions, um, you will do this over and over in every grade level. You will talk about theme, author's purpose, figurative language, embedding quotes. Transferring that knowledge under the pressure of a high stakes time test is a whole nother ball game, but you want to nurture that automaticity for your students. So offering lots of practice experiences for them, building confidence, teaching them like, you don't want to say, oh, this is a big day and it's, we have to make sure you want to keep it like any other day, like any other piece of writing, this is how you approach it. Um, so that they begin to just feel really confident and not triggered by these situations. All right, here's our checklist for this module. Did you write your own essay? Did you color code it? Did you write comments on one, prepper, uh, one practice essay? a student letter on the other practice essay. Yes, check, 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 check. And then just a little quick reflection on the bottom of your draft uh, of your Google Doc. You know, um, what did you, what are your kind of big takeaways from prompt-based writing? What do you want to hold on to and remember about this genre? Uh, and then if you have any other questions for me too, okay? All right, thanks for being with us for this prompt-based writing discussion.